Welcome to Breaking It All Down, I'm Count Zero. It's time for another book review. This week I'm continuing with the Cities in Flight series with book two, A Life for the Stars. This book starts off with a leg up over the first book by starting off with, the, with a city actually preparing to go into flight and leaving Earth. Apparently in the years that have passed since the first book, Earth has just gone down the crapper. The economy of Earth has gotten so poor that Earth cities have started using the spin dizzy technology, the anti-gravity generator from the first book, to leave Earth to seek their fortune elsewhere. However, at the start of this book, the city that we see preparing is less something like, say, Boston, and more like Scranton, Pennsylvania. By which I mean the city that is leaving is Scranton, Pennsylvania. Our main character is Chris, who isn't from Scranton, he's from the area around it, who got press ganged into the, into the city's population when it was leaving, and he decided to get a little too close to watch a city take off, because who doesn't want to see a city fly? That's just actually kind of awesome if you come to think about it. Anyway, after the city manager of Scranton, Lutz, or Lutz, or whatever his name is, every pronounce that, realizes that there is very little they can do with him, he gets traded over to another city, New York. From here, we basically get into more world building as we learn about how Earth and the rest of the world, by which I mean the galaxy or even universe, has changed since the last book. In short, the Spin Dizzy changed the nature of the Cold War by allowing both sides, essentially, to, cha to have to now focus not on destroying each other or outdoing each other, but just hanging on to their citizens and stopping them from leaving Earth for the stars using the spin dizzy and the anti-aging drugs that were being developed in the first book. Um, the cities in flight, you see what I did there, are also known as Okies, as they basically wander from planet to planet looking for work as sort of massive migrant labor populations of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people, depending on whether we're talking to Scranton or New York. We learn this all while Chris is basically getting taught in what life is like on a city after being traded to New York. Now, this section of the book is really fun to read, but really hard to talk about because it's a lot of explaining. Now, don't get me wrong. I like explaining. I do a lot of it on this show. But, still, this book is short. It's in the, practically a novella, and the exposition takes up large chunks of the book. And, while I have no problems doing plot synopses, I don't like doing spoilers, and also I don't like just recounting the entire book to you, because that's boring and it causes you not to read the book. I get, but, you know, like the world building, it's well done world building. You and James Blish really put a lot of thought into the evolution of his world from the uh, first book in the series. Again, it's just it's hard to talk about. That said, there are elements of this story which I really wish would have gotten revisited in other books that were written in the series, or even if he let somebody else play in the universe like Arthur C. Clarke did with some of the subsequent uh, Rama novels. For example, we are told through the ex exposition and the little educational sections of the story where Chris is getting well, taught to become a good productive citizen of New York that the cities have in the past had wars with each other and with other extraterrestrial civilizations um, as well as human colonies and that the main war with aliens became very close to being a, a genocidal war and that the conclusion of the war is something that the cities were ashamed of. And I'd rather have seen this. I'd rather have seen the mindset of the people involved in these decisions for, for going to war and how this war played out, rather than just, oh, there was a war, bad things happened on both sides, we nearly wiped out the aliens, and we're really ashamed about the whole thing. That's brief, that's 
It tells you what you kind of need to know, but I'd rather see more on the topic. But unfortunately, before Blish passed away, he didn't really give anyone any permission to play in the universe. Now, maybe another science fiction writer nowadays could talk to the Blish estate and get permission to go more into this, but unfortunately, even with that, unless James Blish left notes on the Cities and Flights series, it's going to be someone else kind of extrapolating from, his, from Blish's work, as opposed to somebody having a chance to sit down with James talk about what he had in mind for a vision of how this would have turned out, and then expanding on it from there. It's unfortunate. Anyway, as the story unfolds, we get a few little vignettes where things actually happen. One involves a human colony with a semi-medieval tech level that hires New York to build an industrial infrastructure for them, all while planning to secretly roll them for the rest of their tech. The other plot thread story vignette thing, involves New York running into Scranton again, this time after Scranton has messed up an ore processing job and New York is called in to fix things, leading to the two cities to end up coming into conflict. This ultimately leads to Chris coming into his own as a character by using his knowledge of both cities to resolve the situation. Honestly, this is a really good book, and I enjoyed it a lot more than the first book. It feels more like things are actually happening here. There's more action to it. Um, not just in terms of like exciting and two-fisted stuff, but in terms of things happening, people doing things, as opposed to people talking about doing things, or just talking about things in general. And, well, still, the characters are vehicles to exposition, and while they're interesting vehicles for exposition... In particular, Chris has some backstory to him. He has family back on Earth who got left behind. To a certain degree, once we hit a point, those families, he kind of forgets about his family. Like, oh, well, there's no way I'm ever going to get back there. And then the characters kind of drop out of the backstory. I haven't say they drop out of the story because we never see them on camera. Still, while I like it, and while it does have its flaws, honestly... Buying this book on its, own, on its own is something I cannot recommend. It's a very short book. It really requires you to have had some knowledge of the first book in the series. This is the kind of thing where, if you see this book on its own in a used bookstore, skip it. Do not buy it. Walk by, get something else. If you see all four books together, go for it. If you see an omnibus, go for it. But again, I cannot recommend getting this book on its own. It just does not stand alone. Next week, we have the last issue of the Nintendo Fun Club News as I continue Chrono Gaming with Power. Also, since my next episode won't be until the 26th, I would like to wish all of you a Merry Christmas. So until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thank you for watching.